Thank you, Kim, and, and thank all of you for being here on this beautiful, beautiful uh, day, finally. Uh, I'm, I'm very honored to, to get this award, and let me, let me just uh, say a bit about uh, John Martin at the start, and then I'll get on to the paper and where it's gone since. Uh, for those of you who did not know John Martin, he was a very creative, uh, very talented uh, chemical oceanographer who passed too early. He died in the early 19. 90s, he fundamentally changed how we think about iron in the world's oceans. Before his work, uh, the data we had on iron in the oceans was all wrong. There were huge contamination problems. It looked like there was a lot of iron everywhere. John, using careful technique, demonstrated, in fact, iron levels are very, very low in the oceans, orders of magnitude lower than we had thought. Uh, all that happened while I was a graduate student and soon after in the, in the 1970s. He took it a step further and said, you know, I bet because iron is so low that there are portions of the world's oceans, the, the areas where nitrogen and phosphorus is high but where chlorophyll is low, where primary productivity is limited by iron. And that was a very controversial topic at the time, uh, but he's been proven largely right and that fundamentally has changed how we think about the world's uh, ocean productivity. So it's a, uh, it's a great honor to get an award that is named after him. And let's see. Is this connected? Yeah. So th this is the paper, and, and I'm here uh, accepting the award, but I'm doing so on behalf of a large number of, of co-authors, two of whom in the audience, John Downing and Dennis Sweeney. Uh, this very much was a, a joint effort. Uh, all of the authors contributed to the paper, and many contributed deeply to the intellectual content of that, uh, probably more so than, than I in some cases. So it's a group effort. Kim said our paper was cited over 1,100 times. Actually, Google says 1,750 times. <laughs> so it's had a big impact. We're, we're very pleased with that. And a lot of these are not just light citations. It actually has led to a lot of other novel work building on what we've done. So that's a, that's a great uh, feeling to have. It did indeed come out of a workshop. It was the first workshop of the International Scope Nitrogen Project. We held that off the shore of uh, southern Rhode Island, uh, New England, USA, in May of 1993, actually just uh, uh, three weeks before John Martin died. Uh, these are the groups of people we brought together. We, it was pre-tourist season there. It was cold, drizzly much of the time. Uh, we isolated people and we, uh, just, just for context, the ones who have a circle around here are the co-authors of the paper. I'm pleased to say that uh, all of the co-authors are still very much with us and still active intellectually, and although we all look 25 years older, which we are. <laughs> Block Island's a small little place. We isolated people there. We rented all of the major hotels and inns on the island. There's nothing else going on. Uh, this is really largely pre-internet, pre-cell phones. We had people from around the world and there was nothing to do except sit there and talk about the nitrogen budget of the North Atlantic Ocean. And we did that for a week. We actually drank a lot of wine as well, but that's a different story. Uh, the, the question we have are, what are the inputs to and the consequences of nitrogen to the North Atlantic Ocean? So we have this talented group of, of world-class scientists we were very nervous about organizing this because what if they just get bored and drift off to the beach? But people sat there, they argued uh, against pre-internet, so the data sources were gray literature reports, people came with their files and things, some peer-reviewed literature, but not much. We're mostly going through other, other types of materials. It was not a boring meeting at all, it was very exciting. And the context for it, of course, was what humans were doing to the nitrogen cycle of, of the Earth. So over the 20th century, humans created more and more reactive nitrogen, largely through the synthesis of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, made possible in 2000, not 2000, 1911 due to Harbor uh, Bosch process, uh, but other things humans are doing as well. So that as of about 1970, the rate at which humans created reactive nitrogen matched the natural rate of biological nitrogen fixation on the continents, and it's continued to go up since, so it's two and a half times more so now. But of course, nitrogen, unlike the carbon cycle where we put CO2 into the atmosphere and it's globally distributed and globally consequential, nitrogen has a regional influence much more. And the regional distribution of reactive nitrogen is, is, uh, is, is, is high. So we chose the North Atlantic for this first uh, effort because A, it's at that time the best studied of the oceans, but it's also high levels of nitrogen uh, reactive use on both sides of, of the ocean. And it seemed like a good place to pull people together and think about this. 
pre-PowerPoint as well, and our, our, our mode of, of working there was to have these charts. They're about two meters on a side, and they have uh, plastic overlays. This, this one, I, I still have it. This, I took this picture just a week or so ago. Uh, we'd sit there in our plenary sessions every day, and the plenary sessions were held in a, a bar because the bar was the biggest room we could find on Block Island. And we would argue about numbers and put them all down. So this paper and several other syntheses papers out of this special issue uh, come from this sort of work. And here's what it looks like when you clean it up a little bit. This is from the paper. Uh, this plot shows the average flux of nitrogen off the landscape per year, uh, per area. Average over multiple year periods, five to ten years, something like that, as of the early 1980s. And we divided the uh, ocean uh, watersheds up into regions so we could pull data together what we thought was an appropriate scale. And you can see a fair amount of variation here. So if you go to Hudson's Bay, Labrador area, it's only 75, 76 kilograms per square kilometer per year. Orders of magnitude higher in the North Sea, or the Baltic Sea, the northeastern US. It's actually intermediate in the Mississippi River Basin, but of course that's per area, massive area, so massive flows of, of nitrogen out of this area. We're able to determine how much of that came from wastewater and point sources versus how much it was from non-point sources. And I'll just tell you that in all of these regions, the non-point sources dominate. Point sources are important to some extent, some places, but it's really a non-point source issue. And we're able to really demonstrate that at this scale for the first time out of this uh, workshop and paper. So to try and get a handle on, on what's going on with the non-point sources, we came up with this concept, net anthropogenic nitrogen inputs, or NANI, which is probably the most noted thing which people think of, uh, of this paper at this point. And we quantified what humans do in terms of putting nitrogen into the landscape in terms of very simple things. Humans use synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. They create nitrogen through biological nitrogen fixation of crops, which they manage. They either import nitrogen and food and animal feedstocks into a region, or they export from the region. And we add nitrogen uh, through burning fossil fuels and creating oxidized nitrogen, which is deposited on the landscape. So we estimated those for each of those regions and then compared with the output from each region. Uh, it's almost a mass balance approach. It isn't quite mass balanced because we're not including the natural rate of nitrogen fixation. And we didn't do that because at that point in time, there was no way to get good data, good estimates on what those were. But it turns out in all of these regions, they're small. And so we, we really do, in fact, have pretty close to a mass balance. Now, just aside, uh, going into this, I thought, and I think many people thought that getting data at this large spatial scale and using it would be problematic. It's so hard to understand things at small scales. How do you do it at large scales? One of the things we learned is it's actually sometimes easier at large scales. So let me give you two examples. If you want to understand fertilizer fate and do it at the farm scale, it's tough. It's hard to get real data on fertilizer use from a farm because of confidentiality issues. But at larger scales, data on sales of, of uh, fertilizer are robust and readily available. So you, the larger scale, we know what fertilizer is. Same with atmospheric deposition. If you want to know what the atmospheric deposition is on a small forested catchment, good luck. Very difficult to measure, and it depends on which side of the terrain you're on, et cetera. But at large spatial scales, we could use large global models. And as, to the extent you know what the emissions are, you know the deposition fairly well. So in terms of uh, pulling those estimates together for the input, these uh, I won't go through this table, I'll just show you that we generated numbers for each of these inputs for each of the regions. Very, very tedious work. We did most of it at the workshop, a little bit of follow-up later, but again, mostly using hard copy, gray literature, unpublished stuff with a lot of wine. <laughs> and here is probably the most exciting output of, of, of the paper. And I, I don't want to take any credit for this because I was skeptical of even trying this and people did it despite me. So my name's on the paper, I'm here giving the talk, but the real uh, intellectual credit here belongs to people like Jules Beanland and Alan Townsend who went ahead and did it even though I said this was a waste of time. What they did was what we did, but because of their work, was to demonstrate that when you plot the NANI inputs, the nitrogen inputs, this regional scale versus the riverine export, which is what the uh, plot there is, you get a strong linear relationship, highly uh, predictive. 
The slope of that's about 0.2, so about 20% of the nitrogen that people are putting in the landscape comes out in the rivers to the coast, 80% of it does not, and we now know that most of that's denitrified, a little bit stored. So a strong linear relationship. That's surprising to me to this day because these regions have different climates, they have different land uses, different topography, different soils, that all ought to matter, but it doesn't because humans have so altered the nitrogen cycle that it's the inputs which, which control what's coming out. It's a little bit of regional variation, and I want to just say, say a minute about that. Uh, northeastern United States, uh, heavily uh, urbanized area, and you can see that the major input is the atmospheric deposition from fossil fuel use. Uh, agriculture occurs, so there's fertilizer input, but it's less important. Large importation of food and animal feeds, and so a pretty large export as well. Fairly large wastewater component to that, but again, the non-point sources dominate. And then we contrast that with the Mississippi River Basin, less atmospheric deposition, a lot more agriculture, a lot more fertilizer inputs. And here, the region is exporting food for other regions. And so there's actually more nitrogen going down the Mississippi River in corn and soybeans in barges than there is in, in the river itself. Nonetheless, there's a huge amount going down in the river, and of course, that's what causes the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, my colleague Greg McIsaac pulled together this nanny idea at the state uh, scale and just showed how it changed over time. So this is what things looked like in the early 1960s. Only places high nitrogen intensity uses in the New York City area, and that's human consumption. Within a couple of decades, though, it changed like this in the United States with the intensification of agriculture. And this, of course, is what led to the increased eutrophication in the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico and in Chesapeake Bay. Now, we can do a much better job with NANI since then. This is a paper out of my lab, Bongi Hong and, and others. We now have data at the county scale, and we can do much more sophisticated things. The quality of the data are higher, and what we found is the same sort of pattern. So when we pull together data now on NANI from uh, multiple watersheds across the U.S. and Europe and plot them versus a the riverine flux, we get the same. Uh, that just went blank on me down there. We get the same linear relationship, 25% of it's coming out, most of it is not. I'm gonna skip ahead here a little bit because I'm short on time, it turns out. Uh, I just wanna say that the individual components of NANI have some predictive power, and I wanna sp specifically say something about the animal uh, food and feed, the feed movements. If you look at regions where there's a net food and feed uh, export, we have more nitrogen coming out of the landscape as that goes up. That's not surprising. That's the green arrow there. But as you also export more uh, nitrogen uh, in food and feed from a region, the nitrogen coming down rivers also goes up. That's surprising because, of course, you're subtracting from the flow. But, of course, the, the, uh, what's going down the river is driven by the agricultural source, by the fertilizer, et cetera. And the amount of nitrogen that we're taking out in food and feed decreases what would otherwise be coming down the river. But we still get a linear relationship. And I'm going to cut right to the end here in the interest of time and tell you about the very latest work we've done building in this basic concept. And this is a paper by Dennis Swaney and others that we just published uh, a month or so ago. And here we're using the same sort of uh, data, and I'm gonna show you what we can say in terms of nitrogen use efficiency for agriculture across the United States. So nitrogen use efficiency is the nitrogen that's harvested in crops divided by the nitrogen inputs to the system from all sources, and we can do this again at the county scale and then aggregate up. The regions I'm showing you here are U.S. Department of Agriculture regions. And nitrogen use efficiency is of interest because it's the opposite of the nitrogen export to nitrogen pollution that's occurring. So if the use efficiency is high, nitrogen pollution is low and vice versa. And I'll just jump right to this. I'm showing you here region by region, and in the far uh, lower corner there, all of the regions for the United States, nitrogen use efficiency on average at multi-scale uh, counties as a function of the importance of nitrogen fixation as an agricultural input to those. And in areas where nitrogen fixation is the major nitrogen input or significant input, nitrogen use efficiency is quite high at 60% at times. That's very high, which means correspondingly that the nitrogen pollution downstream is low. That's because farmers 
actively need to manage nitrogen fixation. It takes time, it takes area, and they are very careful uh, to not create too much nitrogen. It's costly to them. Contrast that with the use of manure, and there's nothing fundamentally wrong with manure as a nitrogen source except it's commonly overused, and that's shown here in regions uh, where nitrogen uh, inputs are coming largely from manure, the nitrogen use efficiencies are extraordinarily low, less than 10%, which means that there's an extraordinarily large leakage downstream as well. And again, this isn't because manure is fundamentally a problem, it's because there's too much manure in these regions, too much import of food and feed to feed large uh, animal populations, and the manure becomes a waste rather than a resource, and it's used very, very inefficiently creating huge pollution problems. And I will just leave you with that. The nitrogen and manure, again, comes from the importation of, of, of food and, and feeds. So my conclusion is that the simple accounting that we developed uh, is, is an amazingly powerful tool. It's been used by many, many people to gain additional insights. And I'm very pleased to have been part of, of, of that initial effort and to have gotten the award. Finally, I really want to thank the uh, Kim and the ASLA Awards Committee for, for giving our paper this award. Again, to acknowledge my co-authors. And there are a few other people I want to acknowledge in the context of the workshop who are not actually authors in the paper, but were critical to its success. One of whom is the late Scott Nixon, who was our local host, very, very critical in making that, that meeting happen, and, and I and the world miss him. Uh, Jim Galloway is very important in the meeting, and also my wife and long term colleague Roxanne Marino was very, very influential in making the thing happen and she's here today as well. So thank you again for the award.